I'm animator Stephen Brooks. I am The Rubber Onion, and you're listening to The Rubber Onion Animation Podcast. My co-host on the show is Mr. Rob Yulfo, and you'll hear him dart in and out of the conversation because in these interviews, he mostly plays the part of the guy in the corner of the party who you forget is there until he says or does something weird, only to then slip back into the shadows while someone else in the room goes, ha ha, that's Rob. He's great. On this week's episode, we're talking with, you know what, I'll let him tell you. Hi, I'm Harry Partridge, and I'm in no way uh, doing a forced plug. No, <laughs> sorry. <what's> <laughs> Definitely go for that. <laughs> um. Yes, Harry Partridge. I've been following his work for a while, and the first thing that pops into my head when I think of the animation he produces is grandiose. He has a very put-together style, filled with stage-worthy poses and flowing movement. His sense of humor really comes through in the work that he does, and when you talk to him, you really see that same smart silliness. Smart silliness, I like that. TM. Some of my favorite works of his are Saturday Morning Watchmen, with animation you can, the American Akira, his Starbarian series, and the Rift Tracks live intro he did, which is amazing. In this interview, we talk Flash versus Toon Boom. Oh, I guess it, now it should be Animate versus Toon Boom. Uh, YouTube and Twitter comments, New Grounds, Kickstarter and or Patreon, how the Rift Tracks live intro came about, Batman's boobs, Joseph Stalin, Assassins, and money! It's a packed show. And apparently, Harry has the ability to make me laugh like I desperately need air. It's a talent. Before we get into the show, I want to remind you that if you want to participate in this month's Rubber Onion Animation Battle, the topic is Superhero with Useless Power. And the entries are due at the end of February. But hey, this year's a leap year, so you get one extra whole day to work on it. So that's something. You know the deal. 15 seconds or less. Post on Instagram with the hashtag Rubber Onion Battle. But looking forward to seeing them all. I've already seen a couple come in already. They always make me smile. You guys are fat. One last update, video blog 9 is live. It's posted right now on my blog and of course my YouTube channel and this one is an extra long episode. 25 minutes of background design goodness. Special thanks to my patrons on Patreon. If you'd like this episode and other things, consider pledging there and supporting cool stuff like this. So shut up, Steven. Let's get to the cool stuff. I do have to mention before we get in because we have a lot of new listeners. This is an explicit episode of the Rubber and the Animation Podcast. It's an interview. We usually let our interview subjects decide if they want to swear or not. Not, and Harry started early. <laughs> we like that. So there be swears in this episode. I want to say welcome to episode 121 of the Rubber and the Animation Podcast. I love these palindrome episodes. This is our Harry Partridge interview. Enjoy. <laughs> So, Harry Partridge, welcome. Thank you very much for uh, for having me. <laughs> so, sorry, that was immediately. I was like, oh, fuck. He's passed me the ball way too quickly. We're talking with Harry Partridge, animator. I'm curious, what do you think about the term internet animator? Because that gets thrown around a lot, and some people have their thoughts on it. I think it's a pretty fair term to use, as long as you don't let it decide your reach as an animator, like you use it as a crutch, because uh, to say you're an internet animator, people might expect a little less uh, of what you do. Maybe, you know, you cut a few extra corners that traditionally an animator wouldn't sort of be thought of as cutting. It's really a, a means of distribution that I think it describes rather than the approach yeah, because I was going to introduce you as one of the heavy hitters of internet animation. That's just kind of the terms that get thrown around because it is, I wouldn't say it's a genre, but it's something that's kind of came about because of the reach of the platform and Flash. You use Flash, correct? Yeah, kind of combined with a few other things. Uh, what are the few other things? I'm curious. Well, only recently I began using Toon Boom, but purely for the line work itself. So I kind of do animatics and Flash and then export some of that stuff out and then use Toon Boom to do kind of the cleanup and the animation just because the brush tool is way more accurate but that's something literally i've only got into in the last like two or three months and then take that stuff back out of toon boom put it into flash and i do um backgrounds in photoshop and edit in premiere so yeah I, it's a lot of adobe stuff and i bring a few other things into the mix mm. but flash kind of is at the heart of it have you ever used uh, illustrator the brush and illustrator uh no no i haven't it's very similar in that way yeah sure i think there's only a few tweaks that kind of flash would need to do for me to really use it 
a whole of a lot more. A whole of a lot more, sorry. A whole of a, <laughs> a, whole of a lot. Uh, there's not much that Flash would need to uh, change for me to use it more than I do. Um, it needs a better video exporter, although I think the latest version has a pretty good one, but I still use other yeah. software for that. So, like, I use other software just to do bits and pieces, really. Do you work with After Effects at all, or...? Kind of. Like, I know a little bit of After Effects, but I, I can only think of a few things I've ever used After Effects for. I think pixelating out nudity is basically all I've used it for, but I, I know it can do a lot more. Yeah. That. Because they have the creative cloud, I feel like they're pretty comfortable in telling consumers that flashes are vector thing for movement, illustrators are vector thing for static, Photoshop is our raster thing for both, and then After Effects is for putting it all together. So you get the creative cloud, and then you kind of have it as this bunch, whereas Toon Boom puts it all into one package with uh, with Harmony. Yeah, I have no idea how to do anything on Toon Boom other than basic line work, but it's still, I, I mean, I realize it can, it can do a lot beyond that, but I was so impressed by the accuracy of the brush and kind of the, the speed that it empowered me with just by that, that I'm happy just to just have it, you know, as that right now. It could be called brush for all I care. It's interesting. It's like a cleanup tool. You use it yeah, as a cleanup yeah. tool. Uh, do you color in Flash or you color still in, color in like, use I still it for... color in Flash. Yeah, I know Toon Boom has great options for coloring. I think a lot of artists probably fear becoming more technical and learning more technical stuff, and I've, I've never been very, been very good with that. It's a very devastating combination. If you can be both creative and technical, that's awesome. That's how, sort of how you can get to bring all your ideas to life, but I, I'm still bad at learning new software. I bet yeah. it's an efficiency thing too, like a speed and efficiency, because I know that the better that I get at a program, I wouldn't necessarily say that I'm afraid to pick up another program. I just am very aware that it's going to take a certain amount of time. And at this point, it's about doing things. It's about like producing content. Yeah, I, I've never <laughs> had like a, a free 10 days to myself. You know, for the past couple of years, I haven't <laughs> said like, well, you know, I've got nothing to do. Why don't I learn some software? And I, I should do that. And ultimately, I could save some time doing that. But I never feel like I have that luxury. I've used Flash, I think, every day of my life, probably since I was about 15. So we're going uh, for like a decade of using Flash every day. I've probably had a couple of vacations uh, thrown, uh, you know, in there somewhere. But uh, I'm very, very efficient with Flash. What version was that? Well, when I started, it would have been Flash 5, I think, when I was like 15. Flash 5. That's what I started yeah, with uh, yeah. as well. I'm not going to ask how old you are. I'm going to feel really old. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm 28. I don't mind <laughs> telling you. but Yeah, because when you said 15, I was like, hmm, Flash 5, doing the math. Yep, five years. Okay. <laughs> I'm 74. Uh, <laughs> you do have a distinct animation style for being smooth on ones, I believe. I, I kind of wanted to discuss with you a little bit on that, uh, the idea of efficiency and speed and uh, animating on ones versus animating on twos and how did you or where did you learn animation? That's um, a very interesting topic. It's very diverse now. Yeah, I think as a kid, I always had like a pretty good eye. Like I got that it was drawings, lots of drawings moving very quickly. I remember when I was a kid, we used to have like uh, these clear sheets of acetate that we would write on and then the teacher would kind of project them like it would be a, a hymn to sing like at school or it would be like, you know, some diagram and she'd put it on this projector. And I remember being really excited about these because I said, I said to her like this must be what they do to make animation this this clear stuff because you can put that on a background and pay a character and then you you know put another one on and keep the background the same and then you've created like a moving character on a background she didn't know what the fuck i was talking about <laughs> i don't know if i can say that but just this i remember thinking yeah, like totally. wow, this this woman's you know she's She's like in her 60s and she doesn't know that's how cartoons are made. So I always had like a pretty clear idea of what it was and I always felt I could do it. And then when I was 15 and I got Flash and I started to try and figure it out, like it all made sense to me. But I, I really wasn't, I don't think very good until I got the Animator Survival Kit by Richard William. I mean, most people tell you, most animators will tell you if they've read it, it's like a fantastic book. It's an absolutely amazing resource. So that helped a lot and I would recommend that to anyone. I'm not getting some uh, back-end money from Richard Williams for that. It's just a completely honest endorsement. Oh no, you're not getting under the table Williams money? <laughs> <laughs> Let's not talk about Richard Williams uh, under the table or in my back-end. <laughs> <laughs> when Rob is on these calls, by the way, I just have to, uh, to, uh, to break the wall a little bit and say that Rob usually gets nervous because of the words that he chooses and he's very excited when we're interviewing someone and the first time <laughs> they say fuck or something he yeah. gets really excited like oh I can talk I can say Yay. things now <laughs> so we've opened the floodgates for Rob 
Yes, I was just waiting for Don Bluth to just drop an epic bomb anytime soon. <laughs> anyway, uh, so w- would you say that you learned that you learned it on your own trade style? Yeah, I did go to um, a university where I, I I took an animation course for three years at the University for the Creative Arts in Farnham. If anyone is curious in in England, but it was uh, a colossal waste of time in terms of like practically <laughs> learning animation. I had a fun time there, and you know, you like mm-hmm. university is fun, and I made some cool friends but i didn't learn anything about animation they purely said go away and make a short film and come back in three months and we'll we'll grade it there was no no real support there uh, in terms of learning the the skill of animation so yeah i'm self-taught for sure did you go there with any knowledge of you said that you picked it up when you were 15 so you had three years to play around with flash before you went to yeah yeah i was kind of surprised when when i got there meeting other kids because i thought that you know if you went to do something at university and, and learn it as a trade you were pretty committed to doing it possibly for the rest of your life and meeting all these other boys and girls that had entered the course but had never made a cartoon or never tried to make a cartoon before some of them were kind of surprised that you know just with a computer and flash you could make stuff that almost looked like a real cartoon i was surprised by the fact that they hadn't taken that first step so yeah i was not an accomplished animator by any means i still would you know hesitate to say i am now but by that age certainly by 18 i'd only (laughs) well you know know, that's for other people to say but yeah when i was 18 when i went there I, i i had a basic idea already what was the thing that was missing in the courses do you think was it just direction because you say they told you make a short yeah come back later we'll judge you on it but was there no curriculum was there no you know structure what was missing from it in that art school um something that maybe someone else could look at a curriculum and say well that wasn't right for this particular case but maybe another university or another i think uh, would learning shore that up the rules of animation i'm kind of a believer in that rule that if you learn guidelines and you understand theory that helps you to deviate from that theory and, and those yeah, rules and totally. you can break the laws you know learn the rules then you can break the rules we just exactly. sim- we simply just didn't get a foundation we had a guy come in and do like maybe you know 12 hours spread over a few days uh, learning walk cycles mm. that was it in like three years like one or two lessons on walk cycles a few lessons on bouncing balls and it never got into color theory we never got into telling a story visually i know a lot of the people there didn't want to make kind of traditional animated cartoons and you know they wanted to do collage or they wanted to do something more avant-garde some sort of sexual exploration black and white stuff that's fine <laughs> i just think that we'd have been armed far better for making that stuff had we had a foundation in the basics beforehand so where's your style come from personally uh (laughs) well i don't know it's just like a combination of things i've digested over the years i didn't really copy and trace much as a kid i would see something i liked like a comic book or a cartoon and i try and kind of invent my own version of it yeah classic 90s Saturday morning cartoons mixed with I like anime but I don't really draw in that style some video games Marvel comic books it's just what I like a hodgepodge yeah 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 do you have like any uh, like theater background and stuff like that a lot of the movements are very uh uh, th- theater like well i've always been like a big ham there's like a distinct <laughs> smell of pork that just follows me around wherever i go i went into a lot of the theater productions at school that one kind of i went to like middle school and you could actually start to audition for kind of bigger productions you weren't just like plucked and told you're mary or you're joseph and put in front of people i went into that stuff a lot i like musicals i like theater i like singing i like theatrics when you're like a chubby little kid with glasses saying you also want to do oh, musicals is just <laughs> like such a great <laughs> fast track to getting uh, picked on. Did you go to Catholic school? No, I, I did not go to Catholic school. Because you, you're mentioning a lot about Mary and Joseph and singing hymns, and I was just wondering. Oh, no. I, yeah, the, the hymn thing is weird. I don't know if that happens much anymore. Because I don't know. I mean, I didn't go to school here, obviously, yeah. in, the, in the UK. Um, so. No, I always went to just normal state, state schools, but we had, like, we put on nativity plays, and we had to sing hymns, which is weird. Interesting. Yeah. I don't think they do that much that's anymore. So, that's such a foreign idea for yeah. like, Americans, that whole separation thing. No, we had to. We were told to pray, but it was not considered a, a Catholic or religious school by any means. Interesting. Yeah. Topic for a totally different podcast, but I'm just, uh, <laughs> that was just a side note that I was just interested in. With Animate You Can was uh, such a fun thing that we kind of uh, shared around because an animator animating something talking about animation <laughs> was is just fun in itself. But the yeah. thing that I was curious about was uh, it seemed 
more collaborative. There was a lot of animators that were listed off at the end, and there was a mixed media thing. There was um, some claymation stop motion that was in there, and I was wondering how that came about. That has like a weird kind of story to it. I was approached by the YouTube network I was with at the time, no longer, but they're very nice people, and they had a lot of money to commission shorts from some of the people they worked with for YouTube Geek Week. I don't think it had much of a, a theme to it other than geek stuff, which is like everything nowadays, everything in pop culture. Right. And they said like, will you make something for YouTube Geek Week? And I said, what do you want? And they said, well, uh, make a video about you because it'll be promotion. It'll be about you. And I said, I don't really want to make it about me, but I can make it about animation and kind of my relationship with animation. And they gave me some guidelines. They said, you know, it has to have, has to be partially about you. It has to be a song. So I, I did wrote this song with animation. You can. And the money um, that they paid uh, for the what they, they were going to pay was very, very good. I think it would have been the most oh. I'd ever received from a project before. I missed the deadline. And I missed the deadline, so I didn't get a penny from, from the whole kind of venture after I had commissioned a lot of in-betweeners to help me on the project. That's why you see a lot of names on that one, because I had a whole bunch of in-betweeners helping me out. To try to meet the deadline. Yeah, yeah, and I missed the deadline, and I had to pay all of these poor people out of my own pocket. Oh, wow. Because Hold the phone. Wait, wait a second. Yeah. You missed the deadline, so they paid you nothing? D no, I didn't get a penny. I, I didn't get a penny, which is fair, because, you know, when you sign a contract or whatever, and, and you miss a deadline, that's on you. So, yeah, I had to pay all no, these... No, that's, that's not... That is not fair at all, actually. <laughs> yeah. they, they didn't pay you anything to do... I mean, Missing the deadline, I understand taking a hit, but pay you nothing? Uh, I can look through my records. Maybe we shouldn't go to wow. <laughs> too much detail here. But, uh, <laughs> well, I no, no, not, not, I'm, I'm just, not asking for detail. Just how long did that take? That's a big undertaking. Yeah. You had this huge payday that you were expecting. You hired other people. How long did you miss your deadline, let's say? I think once the deadline was missed, I pushed it back for months because I realized we cannot make the deadline. Therefore, right. this has to go on the back burner and I'll do something else in the meantime. But you mentioned the mixed media, the clay stuff, which was done by a friend of mine yeah. called Ollie Putland, who is a great animator. He has a YouTube channel. I was still at the point there which I, when I thought I could make the deadline, but I realized I couldn't do a shot myself. And I'd thought about doing some claymation, but it's not. I don't really have much experience with it. And I thought, why, why don't I just give Ollie the whole shot? And I just showed him what the character looked like. And I gave him the clip. And I said, just please fill this with, with something. Have the character turn into some cool shapes and, and move around nicely. And he, he ran with it and just did something really cool with that. Hey, it looked great. Thank you. <laughs> 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 Let's talk a little bit about Go Animate. <laughs> okay. When you put out that video that was kind of poking a little bit of fun at Go Animate, I thought it was kind of funny. I didn't really take it that serious, but talk about backlash. Articles written, people sharing. I remember <laughs> that. What happened there? And <laughs> did that backlash bother you? The only reason I made that was born less out of the fact that I was really desperate to make fun of Go Animate because I wasn't. I'm really indifferent to the software. I saw somebody else do a genuine Go Animate video. And I thought, like, wouldn't it be funny if a real frame-by-frame -frame animated character ran in and beat the shit out of them? <laughs> it was just that. It was just right. what I thought would be funny. Yeah. And I also thought, man, if it I... It was funny. Well, uh, wow, thank you. But I also <laughs> thought, like, oh, that'd actually be really easy to animate because 90% of it is going to be this easy, crappy animation that I can just do really quickly. And I thought, man, there's a video in that. So I don't really have any qualms with the program whatsoever. I don't care if you use it. But yeah, I got tons of backlash from people that love it. The character in the cartoon, like I sort of drew it to resemble me, but it's not me, you know? I'm not like really raging right, against right. it. It's, it's a horrendous, cartoonish exaggeration of me, both physically and in terms of, you know, the anger level and stuff. I'm just, I'm not like that. The moment you have any eyes on your work online, you will hear some amazing, lovely, generous things, and you'll hear some horrible, horrible things. And I think you have to block out both, because if you believe that you're fantastic or you believe that you're Satan, it's kind of equally damaging, I think. It, it was such a strange thing to watch, because it was kind of like, what happened with that video and talking about Go Anime? Go Anime in general, when it popped up, it split people a lot. All of a sudden, it was like two factions People that were way <laughs> for the idea of it and people that were not. And it was the extremes. And that seems to happen a lot, at least that I've been seeing, maybe even more so now, but it's just been an increasing thing where there's extremes. You're either really for something or really against something. And you kind of stepped into the middle of that. And then it became this thing because, you know, like I said earlier, heavy hitter of internet animation. Now the company is essentially using it for explainer videos, which actually kind of makes sense. Yeah. Carved out a corner for itself. I kind of wanted to use that Go Animate video, not to specifically harp on that and talk about that, but that to me perfectly kind of encapsulated the idea of 
taking something that seemed pretty simple, just a general thought and from a person. And because you are a person, you're not a entire entity that speaks for everybody. Yeah. But well, I think I am. I claim that a lot. I'm always saying that. <laughs> yeah, no. They attach that to you and then used you and that video to say what they wanted to say, pro or con. And I just wanted to know what your experience was with a YouTube comments because the other one was akira i remember when the akira thing came and in the comments all you see is like what this is real and there was like someone wrote like a huge paragraph on how awful it was that they're destroying akira and i just felt like i really wanted to message him and go guys this is a joke this is a, this is a parody but i didn't because it's just a waste of time but yeah. i'm curious what your thoughts are on that type of thing i actually don't see it very much because i don't read youtube comments anymore do you actually not read youtube comments because a lot of people say that and even sometimes I would say that, but yes, okay. I do. I, it's almost like uh, like a recovering alcoholic, you know? Like, a very occasionally, I will take a sip of something and I'll, then I'll lie about it. And if you look for it, you will find times I've replied to comments. But generally, I mean this honest to God, it's probably once a month, maybe I'll read a couple of comments, maybe even less than mm. that. So I probably only read a handful of comments every year. Twitter, I pay a lot of attention to. So if you want to hurl abuse at me, Twitter is a place <laughs> you can get me to read it and, and tear me apart. Has that been something that has happened? Have you gotten abuse on Twitter? No, not very much. Some, but I don't think it's inordinately improportional to what I deserve or should expect. You know, it's it, it happens, but it happens, I think, to pretty much everyone. Proportionate to your popularity, I guess. I guess so, yeah. Is it usually about the animation or just uh, something you said on Twitter? I think normally it's in retaliation to an opinion, and the opinion either can be said on Twitter or it can be in a cartoon. I had a lot of people that were not very happy. I made like a, a Dr. B's cartoon in 2015 was with the only thing I put out in 2015, which is kind of shameful, that was in line with kind of the pro-freedom of speech ethos when it comes to comic book art. There was a big story last year about a comic book cover that was pulled allegedly by the artist themselves, but I think pulled after the backlash, and the backlash came Talking because... Spider-Woman. No, no, not Spider-Woman, although Spider-Woman was another example oh. of that. It was actually a Batgirl comic, and it showed the Joker with a knife to Batgirl's oh, throat, and she yeah. was crying. That's right. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. And you had all these people saying like, this it strips her of her agency. You're showing this female character in a, a weak light. You never do this to a male character. And my point was not, this is good or this is bad. I think you should be able to make as an artist just whatever the hell you like and it's totally up to other people to tell you if it's good or bad or to avoid it or to not avoid it i just don't like the pressure that people may uh have imposed on them by a company or, or even by themselves or by the internet to not make art or to not put out art because it upsets other people i think there should be freedom there and i think that if people are making like legitimately horrible offensive stuff they should have the freedom to put it out there and then we can all tell if they're like a, a huge prick or not and uh that's what's weird about the internet now that you could complain directly and it becomes more of a yeah. threat as opposed to before you just write a letter i'm gonna write them a letter and then you mail it out <laughs> and then they look at it and go i don't like what you did and you go all right fuck that you just throw it in, in a fireplace and just forget about it <laughs> between art and commerce that's a difficult place to be especially now with the internet because you kind of throw in freedom of speech and the idea that if you do something that offends someone else that's infringing on their rights and you do something which someone has to pay for or is propped up by a company. I think like that's where the comic book thing comes in. He does a piece of art, goes on the cover of a comic book that is a company backing that piece of art. So the backlash comes through that. So it's this it's this weird balance between who do you blame when you're offended and how do you say I don't like this thing? And the easiest, quickest way now is the internet. Comments, Twitter, that sort of thing. You could just say it. Sure. You don't have to figure out a way to organize. It's instantaneous. You just see something you don't like and you immediately say, I don't like that. Here are all the reasons I don't like that. And I was going to say about YouTube comments, YouTube comments usually are one off. And even if you comment back to them, like there's not usually a thread of conversation. Sometimes there is, but not huge. Twitter is like known for flame wars. I mean, that someone will say something and then it'll just, it's constant abuse over and over again. If you get that, if you're unlucky enough to get that on Twitter. So it's a different type of And Twitter thing. is a horrible format to have debate in because you're so limited. Something can be taken out of context. You can write 30 right. tweets out and then only one will be retweeted and gain traction or people will get lost in the conversation and not understand yeah. what you're saying. But just to address some of the things you said there, I am totally for that. I'm actually, I am for people reaching out if they have a legitimate criticism. Don't be a jerk 
suck about it. Like, don't say you made this and it's awful and you suck. If you say, this is why I think you are wrong to do this. I believe that the freedom of speech, if things are tense between people, the cure to that is more speech, not less. You talk more about mm. it and hopefully it should be civil and have a debate. I think it's better when everyone can express their ideas rather than things that are taken away. And that's all I was saying. It, it was not that I have a problem with people expressing their problems. I think that's healthy and normal. It's only when pressure is put on people or a company or whoever to get rid of something. I think that we should vote with our wallets as adults if we do not like a comic book or a video game or a movie. And there's so much stuff out there that I absolutely have no interest in or I think is gross or weird. I just don't look at it. I don't buy it. I avoid it. And I, I live my life. And I, I think that is the best approach for everyone to take because that means then that everyone gets to avoid what they don't want and partake in what they do want. So that's what I believe anyway. As you were saying that, so much effort gets goes into making animation, making a joke. And if you're talking about over time, I I don't have the stats in front of me about how long you've been uploading things to YouTube, I guess from pretty close to the beginning, or at least the internet on Newgrounds, big on Newgrounds. Point being, over time, social norms, social acceptance shifts over time. On top of that, you also grow. And we've talked a lot on this podcast about people's own beliefs and thoughts and the words that they use, the way they communicate. I mean, people change over time. And if you're looking at someone who has like a 10-year career of uploading content, what they may have found funny or the stuff that they may have uploaded before is not necessarily something they would have uploaded now. And I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Are you worried that when you look back at your catalog, are you worried that your back catalog pushes boundaries that you wouldn't necessarily feel appropriate now? Or do you feel like that's in its time? everything's totally okay? Or do you just look back at it and be like, everything's everything's fine? <laughs> um, I look back <laughs> at it and think, why wasn't that better? Why did I make that funnier or make the animation better? <laughs> I don't think I, I look back and I'm kind of grossed out by any ideas I've had. I happen to think that there's nothing I've said or done that is particularly horrendous. So I think that it's in good fun. This has definitely been in the news lately with comedians. People will drag up jokes that they've made yeah. 10, 15 years ago. You evolve and you change over time. Yeah. But with the internet Internet, over time, it's like it doesn't change. Someone will look at your first video as though you just uploaded it today because, yeah. you know, it exists. I guess then that's something that might happen over time. Maybe 10, 15 years from now, um, I'll look back on the stuff I've mm. made today or in the past differently. But as of the moment, I don't feel too sh ashamed by anything I've made in terms of kind of the uh, the tone or the offensiveness of it. I I'm ashamed for other reasons. Like, did I really not have a sound effect for that? I had to make the phone noise by going <laughs> bring, bring into the microphone. Is that the kind of shit that I did at the start? And that's what I'm ashamed by, not really my ideas. Yeah, th there's some stuff I would have done better. At the moment, I don't feel like society is coming knocking on my door and telling me off yet, maybe in the future. How did Rift Tracks come about? That's a hard left turn, but I want to I want to get on something <laughs> yeah. really positive because I am a huge fan of Rift Tracks, a huge fan of Mystery Science Theater 3000, and Rob and I have gone to a couple of them. I told you on the pre-show conversation that we were having that Rob and I just went to, and I think it was Starship Troopers. It was that Rift Tracks Live. We're just sitting in the theater, and all of a sudden, this intro animation comes up. And go, that's that's Harry Partridge. That's got to be Harry Partridge. Either that or someone stealing it. I was about to get really upset, but no, it was, I'm happy for you and mad at you at the same time that you got to do that. So how did that come about? Well, I've always been, always, uh, <laughs> I've been for many years a huge fan of Mystery Science Theater. I didn't erupt from the womb talking about <laughs> Rouse Dower. Um, yeah, I've liked Mystery Science Theater for years and years and years. And I followed uh, Bill Corbett. Well, I follow. I didn't stop following him. Uh, Bill Corbett, Michael J. Nelson, I think Joel Hodgson as well, and Kevin Murphy, all on Twitter. Love those guys. And a couple of others that are involved in the show. And I just like occasionally, like you do, you tweet at people that you're a big fan of and they don't get back to you because uh, you know that's, right. that's how it goes they're in, inundated with little mouths that all want a worm like little birds yeah reference twitter conversation earlier yeah and i uh, <laughs> i tweeted something at bill corbett and he followed me it was like a, just a dumb joke but he retweeted the stupid little joke i sent him this real fangirl message like oh god a follow i am so unworthy and then i said if you ever need an animator or an artist for anything i am yours like a weird kind of online whore just i like, threw myself a bill <laughs> Corbett. And, uh, and funnily enough, like, I thought that was probably too much. And he said, like, oh, thank you. That's very kind of you. 
And then like one day I got a message from him and uh, him saying, you know, we, we think we have something we'd like to talk to you about. I was a fan of Rift Tracks too, of course, Mystery Science Theater to begin with, uh, but I, I was, you yeah. know, watching Rift Tracks around the time. And yeah, he just sent me a message and said, we're doing this um, intro for our live shows that we want it to be animated. They had the song by Jonathan Coulton already. Uh, that yeah. was all taken oh, care I was, of. I was wondering, did you get to communicate with him as well? But they, they already no, had it done. No, or... I did not oh, okay. communicate with him, but yeah, I he's did great too. Uh, have a lot of back and forth emails with, uh, mostly with Bill, um, occasionally with other people that you know have to deal with like finances and stuff and um sure. like the biggest moment for me was i got to chat with them uh the three kevin mike and bill on skype and some other person who i don't remember some finance dude who was flown around <laughs> uh, but i got to talk with the three of them and we did it and they were very patient i took a long time to do it because i'm me and because it's animation and uh, they were kind enough to let me put it on my youtube channel i recently got a content claim for it which i was a bit peeved about because i asked them if i could put it on my youtube channel and they, they said, yes, right. and now I'm no longer earning from it. But it, you know, so it would be a f- couple of pennies per month, probably. So it's not a big deal. But yeah, I, I've never seen it live. I've never been to one of the live shows. People tell me it's up there and I believe them. And that's that's yeah, it, really. it doesn't come here to the UK. No, uh, no I was, I was bummed about that because they had they had a push last year. They did the room and everything. And there, were, there were a bunch of movies. Miami. Uh, oh, shoot. Oh, Rob, we watched it. Yeah. Miami. Like the, the Kung Fu. Friends forever. You know that. Is it Miami Connection? Miami Connection. That's it. <laughs> we're such fans listen to us we're like what the fuck was that called it was the song about friends where they were singing about like we're friends forever oh yeah friends forever will be together we're on and then they had this knockdown drag out brawl where they're just they're killing people with swords and everything blood all over them and at the very end there's this text that comes up and it's like uh, you know we together we can knock out vi- violence doesn't solve anything <laughs> all this stuff that comes up just, did you not see the end of the movie <laughs> Uh, anyway, so yeah, I really wanted to see that and I, I can't because it's not in the UK. Uh, that's just, that's me cutting into the interview talking about me. <laughs> so yeah, Rift Tracks, how long did it take you to do that video? Because there, it is dense. There is a lot of stuff in there, which is great for an opening as well, because it's one of those things that you can watch over and over again and catch all the little oh, Easter eggs. I, I had plans to cram in a lot more, but I just didn't, you know, I didn't have time. We probably <clears> started <throat> talking in like le- very, very tail end, like November, December of 2013. And I think it came out sort of mid-summer of 2014, but I, I went back and forth. I did sort of stuff in between. So I guess like maybe two, three months in total, but all done in Flash. So Flash does take me longer to animate in than Toon Boom. Hopefully that will mean good things for the future. We originally had a lot more kind of stuff crammed in that I wanted to do, but I, I didn't have time or they were concerned. Um, we had a lot of really recognizable characters. We had, you know, Iron Man, Darth Vader, Jack Sparrow, Harry Potter, Frodo. We had mm. all these like brilliant huge movie characters from the last 10 years they kind of got cold feet about that a little bit and they said no please put in more Rift Tracks characters so we took out all the okay. really recognizable characters there's a few still left in that were either animated before we decided to take them out or they just got left in for some weird reason some oversight mm. uh, but it would have had a lot more of a connection I think with movies in general rather than just the Rift Tracks canon but what was the issue about adding those those characters was this just like a I, copyright IP probably. copyright or, yeah or copyright IP dated? even though we still left some, like we still left in Darth Vader, and I'm pretty sure that Disney are pretty protective uh, of their copyright. I think it was that thing of like, we think this could be a problem, we don't know, yeah. but fuck it, we don't want to really yeah. spend the time looking into it. We had a lot of recognizable characters like Avatar and Harry Potter and stuff that you see in, in it. Twilight One Thor. of the get-arounds of that was, let's put a TV frame around those shots. So we're saying that it's they're happening on a TV, that will protect us right. from copyright. And I don't know if that's true or not, but I you know, I just, it was a job, yeah. so I did what I, I did what I what I had to do and what I thought would work. Well, you mentioned about because uh, of that claim, you had to take it off of monetization. That word, I think it automatically means the monetization. The benefit of the money goes to them rather than me. I see. Look, I've only been on YouTube for a decade. I don't really know how it works. I don't, don't come asking me for adv- advice on technical YouTube stuff. I'm really shitty with it. Well, then I, I guess we don't need to get into the you know that kind of details and stuff. But I, I was curious because in the last five months or so, things have really been changing for that. Ever since um, they announced the YouTube Red, copyright claims, fair use claims have changed. The Nostalgia Critic, I forgot his name, Doug, Doug Walker, Walker, I think, just, yeah, just went through this thing with one of his videos, and he, he basically, just because he's so popular, he got it fixed. The YouTube went, oh, okay, 
yeah, yeah, this is fair use, and they reversed it. Have you had any experiences with that? I mean, you make some parody videos and things. A lot of the time I do. I do use yeah. some royalty-free music. Stuff nowadays, if it's not made by me, it's, it's royalty-free. But, like, I made some dumb decisions early on. I used a Devo song in one of my videos that now, you know, had a copyright claim. Yeah. It happens. But I think by virtue of doing animation and, like you say, you know, either creating the music or um, having royalty free, I don't really run into problems like that at all, really. I mean, aside from the riff tracks thing, which there was a copyright claim against what? The song, I assume. I guess the song or the video in general. I guess it's just, it's because it is technically owned by them, but it was uploaded with permission. Yeah, like I say, like pretty much unscathed by that kind of thing. Okay, well, then. And uh, moving on, um, <laughs> the Fine <laughs> Brothers uploaded their thing. They tried to do this. What do we call it? It was React World. Yeah. Wanted to trademark uh, React. And we kind of talked a little bit about it, just us on the on the pre-show. And Rob and I have already talked about it on the podcast that will have already been up by the time that this episode goes up. But I wanted to get your thoughts on just the, the landscape of, of YouTube as it's changing. You know, you've seen basically every change that has happened to YouTube. Yeah. How does this rank? I, you know, and you could talk about the Fine Brothers if you want, but just the size that YouTube is growing to. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think by virtue of like making animation, which obviously I can't make very many very quickly, um, and never making enough from YouTube to really support me financially by itself, I've never put a whole lot of stock into uh, keeping tabs on all the changes on YouTube. If, if it was my sole source of income, I would probably be much more plugged into it. But, you know, changes come and changes go. There was a Google Plus integration, which now I don't think is yeah. as important. It's changed a lot over the years and I never really worry about it too much. I, I hope I'll always have a YouTube channel where I can share my work but if suddenly tomorrow I stop making money from it or my earnings were sort of negatively impacted, I wouldn't be made destitute by that change and because of that i just don't think about it too much this is a really roundabout way of saying i don't know Stephen. i don't have anything to say about youtube well, but i just i'm just not into it enough i don't think you are a content creator you create things you upload them and as long as they aren't taking your videos down you pretty much just go look this is a platform for me, for me to get out there you said that you don't look at it as a source of income. I remember there was a there was a blog post a while ago on uh, Cartoon Brew that was talking about money. And I remember, was it you who contacted them and say, what you have reported or what they have reported is like, not at all what I make. It's just yeah, an estimation. Yeah, that was, a, I guess, maybe two years ago or so. But uh, yeah. YouTube earnings of animators was like the subject of an article on Cartoon Brew. And they had this like really wildly exaggerated estimation of what we earned. <laughs> I wouldn't have said anything had it just been general, but it said, you know, Harry Partridge, Chris O'Neill, it had like a bunch of animators create stuff on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And it had estimations for what their channels earn. And they were just way, way off. So I said, guys, I think I have to correct you on this. I do not earn this amount <laughs> of money. And I remember one of their responses, I don't know if it was directly to me or to somebody else, but they said something that kind of... Uh, <laughs> It kind of just groped me the wrong way. Uh, it, they no, said, Cartoon Brew saying something that... <laughs> oh, yeah, I know, right? But they said, like, well, you have to understand, these people have an interest in cultivating the image of a starving artist. There's a reason that they would want their fans to think that they earn less money than they do, which I guess is true. Whoa. It's true that people... It, it might be of, of benefit to uh, project yourself as having no money, but I don't try and do that, and I was not lying to hide earnings. I, I was being honest with them. I was trying to correct their mistake... And their retort to that was, well, you know, uh, we understand if you are lying about this, it's okay. I thought like, geez, <laughs> it's not <laughs> yeah. the case. It's crazy because that is a topic that comes up a lot when you talk about internet animators, money, monetization, you know, making money off of YouTube and, and with YouTube changes. Rob, we talked about it a while back. Who, who was it? Was it Ross O'Donovan? Was that, he's the one who uploaded that video that was about YouTube changes? Is, is that right? Am I right? About, well, with, as far as animation? Yeah, about uh, uh, you, the YouTube changes... Uh, uh, being bad for animators because it changed the earnings to amount of time, amount of minutes. Was it Rubber Ninja? That's Ross O'Donovan. Oh, okay, yeah. That's his name. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> he was a Rubber Ninja at birth? <laughs> <laughs> I know that they changed based on minutes viewed, and that was kind of a big deal. Did you feel that effect? I did. I did see some drop off not yeah. so much that it like really concerned me and like i say my earnings don't really come from youtube so i don't um, right. consider that to be like a, a major factor for me but uh, no, yeah just... I, I did notice some of that my my opinion about it is i understand there are a lot of people that make their living from youtube and if they're if they work 
really hard at it. I I think it's uh, a huge problem for them to have their earnings diminished. And you know, YouTube should. I, I would be nice if they could have something in place to um, protect you know people that are making good content and work hard at it. But I've always felt like um, it's just one of those things that for me is out of my control. I don't think that I obviously Ross did try. He made a video, and I think he's he may have even spoken directly with some people that make decisions over YouTube, and that's great. But I never really thought that I would have much of a chance to change the way that things work. And it's kind of a say la vie situation where I accept it's not my website. I don't make the rules. I'm happy that I can share my work there and make some money from it. So I've always uh, sort of thrown my hands up in the air and said, you know, I, I accept the terms. If I if I didn't accept the terms, I would leave YouTube. I don't I don't run the show over there. So um, I'm, I'm just kind of happy to roll with the punches. Not to be too direct, but where does your money come from? Your earnings? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. I. Uh, well, for every year other than 2015, since I started doing this, uh, it, it's been from major commissioned pieces of work. So I mm. did the Rift Tracks intro would be an example. Sponsored content video game videos like Hitman video was paid for. Some of the Elder Scrolls videos were paid for, but not all of them. Some were just made by, by virtue of me being a huge fan. And every year, like one or two of those was kind of enough to keep me ticking over. I just, I like sitting down at my desk and drawing. So I'm not uh, spending on some kind of crazy lavish uh, lifestyle. So that was usually those, those gigs would keep me going. In 2015, I didn't get a job like that until the very end of the year. And I'm still working on the actual animation for that. I instead sort of switched to commissions and I accepted hundreds of commissions priced anywhere between like 15 bucks and 60 bucks. I think I should have You're accepted art, more. Like yeah. illustrations? Yeah, just just one-off illustrations. So that sort of kept me afloat. And in the future, I'd like, first of all, I want to make a lot more content. Um, I put out one new video last year, which was dire. Uh, talk about, you know, <laughs> being ashamed of what your output is. Um, I'm ashamed for my, my lack of it in 2015. So I, I do have a plan to um, sort of pursue Patreon and that might fail. That might work. Hopefully it, it will help out. I hope that sort of by doing that, I will be able to make my own content. I, I kind of feel now that my goal is to uh, concentrate on things I've written and that come come from me and it's it's not sponsored content. Every Everything I've done has has some of me in it. You know, I direct all the sponsored content I, I do and, and you write it and voice it and stuff. But uh, I really want to kind of develop my own characters and my own stories in animation and hopefully Patreon So when you do get these that. commissions for like animated shorts, for instance, or, or whatever it is you were talking about, like that is stuff that you could share. That's the cartoons, animated shorts, that sort of thing. Like you're not talking other type of work that nobody ever sees. No, like I've done very, very little of that. Like I've done some logos mm -hmm. and some stuff, but no, pretty much <laughs> that, that's going to wow, make some people great. think I'm even lazier uh, than they might already uh, consider me to be when they find <laughs> out that basically if I've made it, it's online. I don't have much I'm holding back. That's great. I mean, obviously it takes a long time to do, you know, animation. Like if, if you can keep yourself afloat, or actually make a living doing the things that you would want to do and share that content or at least have it online. Something fun, something cartoony, something. The Rift Tracks gig, is a, that's an amazing gig. That's something that really lines up with something. You, you follow them, you enjoy yeah. what they do, and you were able to do a commissioned job. You were, you were able to get a gig doing work for them. It's not a animated short you did yourself, but they paid you. You you did it. It, it went up on your channel. Sure. It worked out well. Yeah, I've made it a point. I have been offered jobs over the years that don't tie into my interests. Like, I wouldn't just, yeah. unless it paid <laughs> ridiculously well, I, I wouldn't accept, you know, like, uh, do a funny tampon ad. You know, I don't think I have anything to say about that. I was offered <laughs> some money to do, like, a something about a ra some racing game, and I just don't play racing games. I can't remember which one it was, uh. but I just, I had nothing to say, so I said no, but even though I don't really play Hitman, man I like assassins. I, I, you know, I like those kind of games. I like violent video games. So even though it wasn't really a huge hitman guy, I was like, like you I like assassin games. I just want to be clear that we're talking. <laughs> no, I'm just, just a fan cool. of Maybe murder. I just really, really like assassins. They're great. I love their work. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say that so I don't get any come after me. He's one of us. Thank you for appreciating my work. Another one's coming. Um, <laughs> that was creepy. Might cut that out. So let's move on. <laughs> okay, so I put a call out on Facebook asking people for questions the same way that I always do. we got some audience questions. You want to answer some of those? Let's do it. I would feel bad if these people posted questions and they didn't get answered. So yeah. All right. Okay. So here we go. Starting uh, starting top down here. We already talked about the YouTube uh, changes and their policies. Lamont Wayne asks about that. 
and he also brings up the issue of Newgrounds. And I didn't actually say anything about Newgrounds. We upload the podcast to Newgrounds. I upload animation to Newgrounds. You're big on Newgrounds. I just want to know what you, what are your thoughts and feelings on Newgrounds and the way that it has grown and that community there. I love Newgrounds. I feel like one of those <laughs> movie actors who says like, my first love was the theater. My first love was Newgrounds <laughs> yeah. because Newgrounds has changed over the years. And you said, how, how has Newgrounds grown? I don't think it's controversial to say that Newgrounds has not really grown as much as it's actually shrunk. I think that the growth of YouTube has made Newgrounds position harder to hold over the years. You can notice that views did drop. I think they're possibly on the rise again, but uh, it was tough for a couple of years. I'll always upload my stuff to Newgrounds. I love the guys that run the website. They're really awesome. I have made a lot of friends on you on Newgrounds. Uh, nearly said YouTube yeah. there. Newgrounds. <laughs> <laughs> and YouTube, yeah. Uh, it's it's a fantastic website. The one thing that I would, I, I hope is going to help keep Newgrounds afloat, and this is what I, I'll tell any kind of aspiring person who for some awful reason wants to make animation and put it online, not that I recommend <laughs> doing that, kids, is uh, upload it to Newgrounds because it's much easier to find an audience for your work on Newgrounds by nature of having like a more focused, smaller community. If you do good work, it will go noticed if it's really good and it probably will get front paged. And though it's unlikely you'll get a million views anymore because that's just not the reality of uploading stuff to right. Newgrounds at the moment. The fact is you could get 50,000, 10,000, 100,000. And if you make a YouTube channel that no one's ever heard of and you make a great short film about your original characters and throw it up on YouTube, the fact is it might be awesome, but it might only get 100 views because it's a kind of sad fact that people don't search for things they've never heard of online. Uh, but on, on Newgrounds, you can get spotted. I'm always recommending Newgrounds to people, like whatever. It's like, oh, I want to show this somewhere other than YouTube. And I say Newgrounds. You get, I honestly get more attention on Newgrounds than I do anywhere else. And they're like, oh, mm. I think I'll try Vimeo or something. Said like, it's like they kind of just kind of no, push it. No to attention the side. on Vimeo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Vimeo is just kind of like and a the lost comments. World. We've talked about the comments that we get because you'll. Yeah. I mean, of course, anywhere that you upload, you're going to get comments that are spanning from you know oh this is kind of cool to you're terrible and i want to eat your face <laughs> but uh, as far as the comments that are substantive that that have that talk about animation talk about design talk about oh i like this special i like this little thing where you had uh you know the this person move around the way that the fabric waved in the wind yeah. as it turned around like you only get those comments at yeah, least yeah. i do on new grounds they will oh, pick they, yeah, and they particular point animation out points out and talk about it wherever i just got lazy at a certain point they will point it out and they will notice yeah. that which is They're sometimes informed. way more heartbreaking yeah. that this sucks, this is stupid or something. I'm like, oh no, you noticed that. I was lazy. <laughs> it's interesting that you brought up about the amount of views uh, shrinking. I guess when I said expanded, I was thinking the audio portal and uploading videos as opposed to just SWFs and things like the functionality of the site has gotten bigger. While you're right, the community has gotten much more of a of a focused group. Yeah, definitely. And it, it, you can upload you know, art. You couldn't right. six, seven years ago. That's sort of something that's, that's been brought to the website as well. I really don't want to paint the I, the image of Newgrounds sort of being this like diminishing force online. I, I no. do think they're growing. And I think that Tom Fulps really committed to continuing to develop the website. Um, now you can support the website financially and that will get rid of ads so people can give money and support the website. I don't think they're going anywhere. I think that they're going to weather the storm and, and come out on the other side of it. So yeah, I don't think Newgrounds is, is going away. You did, the, is good. Uh, <laughs> you did the Christmas background, didn't you, for the... Uh, yes, uh, yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. great. Oh, Thank cool. you. So Alex Dudley asks, uh, he says that a lot of animators have found great success in making fan animations and parodies. He says, what does one need to do to get their original creations a chance to reach that same success? Or is it, is it even possible? It comes down to how much of a marketer do you want to be for your own stuff? Mm. Certainly, if you make a cartoon about Batman fighting Darth Vader, you're going to get way more views, right. likely, than if you create two original characters and put them in a fight. Because, like I said, people do not search for things they've never heard of. It's just that's the reality of it. But if you don't want to do that, if you want to create your own original content, there are still, you know, things you can do. Like, I'm not going to lie, a lot of the thumbnails of my cartoons have boobs in them. And those <laughs> tend to get more traction than the ones that don't, I think. And even though they're original boobs, they're my own boobs that I've created. <laughs> That's marketing, you know? You're grabbing attention from people. You can do that kind of stuff. I mean, I happen to like boobs legitimately. I don't feel I'm selling out by putting them in my thumbnails. <laughs> uh, it's a very honest love. Really putting yourself out there. Taking a stance. Yeah. Mary Parcher's I usually likes put boobs. A, I usually put a thumbnail of Batman with boobs. Oh, like, see, that, that's the thing. That would do so well. That's a sad fact. I mean, you can make catchy titles. You can put 18 plus in parentheses in the title of your video, and that will 
will get some attention. You can put it all in caps. You can describe the video. I, I find that videos on YouTube that have original animated film or amazing animated film in the title, they seem to get more attention because you're getting even more information across there to kind of snare in viewers. I don't like doing that stuff necessarily, but I understand it's it's really tough, I think, to be a total newcomer and to want to make original content and to get it seen. So you might have to be a bit ruthless in the early years. The nice thing is that you can change thumbnails, you can change titles, you can, you know, revise stuff later on, maybe once your work has been seen and you're starting to kind of get the snowball rolling. But I think ultimately, like all that stuff aside, this is a, a terrible answer, but I also think it's the truest answer. Make it good. Yeah. I think the cream will rise to the top if it's really legitimately good work. Even if you can't get someone to see it straight away, if you send it to people, you tweet it out to people, you, again, this is marketing, but if you get it seen, hopefully they'll show other people and word of mouth and people will link and tweet and, and just you'll get some attention that way. So uh, I think ultimately, if you make really good work, it will be seen. It's a little I idealized to say that. A little, mm. what's that word? <laughs> it's, Idyllic. It's a little bit, uh, uh, yeah, it, it might be unrealistic realistic to say that because there is certainly a great amount of work out there that's fantastic that people don't pay attention mm. to but uh, i think that will make your chances uh, the best that they could be christian kelly asks kind of a broad question here so i'll ask and we'll see what comes of it a question about broads <laughs> boobs bat boobs yeah. <laughs> ironically asking about bad boobs do you ever feel bad that there's so much art to appreciate with all the time and hard work put into it but not enough time to appreciate it all interesting side note the amount of content that's being put up there on the internet the amount of great content has exploded. So I guess, you know, that's an interesting topic. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, actually, uh, this is a thought that I have probably daily because what I do for a living, drawing, making animation, requires I work pretty much every day. And on average, I will work like 10 hours a day. And I don't really take weekends. I work a lot is what I'm, <laughs> what I'm saying. It's the <laughs> image I'm trying to cultivate here. I, I don't have much time for enjoying art, which is actually one of my favorite things to do in the world. I don't watch every new film that comes out. I don't watch a lot of films that get great reviews. I don't play a lot of video games. I don't listen to a lot of new music, although music is something you can listen to while you animate, so I, I get some music in. There's a lot by the nature of, of doing what I do that I don't get to see because I'm just working all the time. And it bums me out because I think that ultimately you do stunt your growth if you don't take in enough stimulus. If you want to be a filmmaker and you don't watch other people's films, obviously you're going to miss out there on a lot of information that you could be soaking in, a lot of tips you could pick up. It's, it's a shame. I think you have to strike a balance. I think that the time that you do take away from work, you do have to go out and, and take in other important, good examples of other people's work. Does that kind of answer the question? Yeah, no, it totally does. Okay. Yeah, it's, you know, you're talking about your influences earlier, about all these different influences come in. It was just a hodgepodge of things. There is a risk that as you're producing content and not being able to absorb that content, that you will stick in your style and don't really grow out yeah, from there. I felt that a lot. I do worry about that kind of stagnation. Yeah. That's a very real worry. It's a very interesting time for content creators because there's this platform and there is actual opportunity for getting seen and actually making money so it actually encourages people to make more and so more gets out there this stuff in it's not just movies and tv now it's on the internet as well having all these places to absorb the content it's hard to keep up mm -hmm. all right so joel townsend uh, says your song about animation you said you want to make movies but you turn to animation instead is that really true yes <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Shall I elaborate a tiny bit on that? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Please. I, I think I've said this before somewhere, but uh, I guess it's not a problem if I repeat myself. I was probably 13, 14, 15 is at the age that I really realized I wanted to, among other things, make movies. Even though it was becoming easier, there still wasn't the accessibility to things like high def cameras. Um, I didn't know about like digital editing. Also, when you're 13, 14, 15 and you want to make fantasy movies, which is basically what I'm interested in making. I like horror, superheroes, barbarians, space, all those kind of things. How the hell do you do that when you have like three spotty friends that are all dudes? You don't have a wide variety of actors. You can't create the sets. You can't do the effects until you say, well, why don't I just go with animation instead? And the fact is that it, that was the way that I could tell my stories. And because I could draw a bit, I was able to sort of merge those together. And I was able to make outrageous stuff where people had their heads cut off or they were 
dragons or barbarians or whatever I wanted to put in it, I could do with animation. And I couldn't do that with live action. If I would have been able to do that, do that with live action, had I been the son of like Steven Spielberg or something and had millions of dollars <laughs> at my disposal, which, you know, his kids might not have. They, I, I don't know if they get a lot of uh, money from that. But uh, Well, your dad was a musician in a band. I mean, I guess you'd make music, but, you know, maybe if you were the son of well, Steven actually, Spielberg, yeah, you would, my would dad, have been a boxer or something. <laughs> he has a lot of uh, like recording gear and stuff. If I wanted to make music as a kid, I probably would have been able to do that a lot more readily. But yeah, the fact is animation was a way that I could tell stories with that. I'm starting to realize now, the older I get, animation is great and I love animation, but I can't create my longer ideas for stories yeah. so easily in animation without picking a very limited kind of style of animation, which I don't really want to do. I think I might have to adopt that at some point, but I do want to experiment more with live action now. And it's crazy to be 28 and talking about one day I'd like to do this. I feel like, you know, coming up to 30, I should have really done this by now because it's something I've wanted to do for years. But yeah. I mean, I'm 33 and I'm feeling very similar thing. Uh, it's, it's a means to an end. I tell my stories, I do my <laughs> thing, but constantly trying to find that different way to put content out there that doesn't infringe on my ability to also do animation. It's a difficult yeah. balance. I love animation and I, and I love live action both. It just so happens that yeah. live action is something that I don't have a lot of experience in, but I think ultimately would be the way I could tell a lot of my story ideas. So I think I will have to flirt with it at some point. And I have. I have made things in live action, but they're just not online either. I don't think they're good enough yet or it wasn't quite right, mm. I thought, to put online. But uh, it's definitely something on the horizon. All right, got a few more questions here, so I'm going to try to go through them a little quick. Ronnie E asked like three questions. Uh, Ronald Shapiro, Ronnie E, Ron Tron. Well, <laughs> he says, uh, so I'm just picking one of them. He just wants a Starbarian update. Oh, okay. I don't want to give a date because I know that that will <laughs> bite me on the backside <laughs> in the future. Yeah. All I can really speak to is what my intentions are. My intention mm. for Starbarians <laughs> is still to make Starbarians a series, but I haven't put out an mm. episode in two and a half years, almost. Mm -hmm. Maybe exactly two and a half years now. So yeah, it's laughable to call it a series, but I would still like it to be. The fact is that the episodes just take months and months to make, maybe like six months for a full three and a half minutes if I don't have assistants working with me. So yeah. I've got to find some ways to streamline that. And I, I do want to streamline the process a little bit, hopefully not so that it's sort of visible, but I would like to cut back on the in-betweens a little bit in 2016 and put out some cartoons. I would be very unhappy if I couldn't put out at least two or three episodes this year, wrap up the kind of story that I started in the second one and didn't finish. It'll happen. I've certainly not closed the book on it. I have an idea for a Starbarians feature length movie that I want to do, an animated movie. Nice. You know, there's so much I want to do. I want to do merchandise and, and t-shirts and stuff this year. It's just, <laughs> it's just, how do you find time to do it all? I went to go and get groceries this morning with my partner, Joyce. We just went and grabbed some food and I came home and I've been animating like these eyes for like the entire day and I probably did like six or seven frames of these eyes because it's like a close up where they're filling the whole frame so there's like lots of details and stuff uh -huh, and it's just yeah. when you do that when you realize it's going to take you 12 hours to get like one shot that is basically a close up of some eyes that's a second long it's yeah. crazy to th talk about it's hard doing... to sit down and do it yeah yeah it it's really just crazy is. to talk about doing an animated series and dozens of episodes and stuff like that when you're struggling to do just some eyes <laughs> but I would I, I still I'm going to go for it there will be an update eventually so the next question is kind of fun because it goes along with that previous one. Uh, James T. Nethery Regents, he asks... <laughs> My question is, how does Harry stay sane when his fans are constantly bothering him over social media about when the next cartoon comes out? Well, does that push him to animate faster, or does he ignore it and keep going at the same pace he always does? There's a presupposition there that I'm sane, which could be <laughs> completely an error, but no, I... Yes. <laughs> like, actually, the majority of the people are really, really cool. I, I do, like, I, you know, get tweets occasionally saying, where's the new cartoon? Put something out, which is still yeah. nice. It's not like they're saying, please don't put out another cartoon. Right, I'm totally. I'm horribly offended by that. But actually, I'm surprised the majority of the people that contact me say, take all the time that you want, I'll wait as long as I have to. And the funny thing is that I want to reply to them like, no, I don't want to take all the time in the world. I want to put stuff out. <laughs> I I have a lot of ideas for cartoons that I wish I could be putting out. I, I don't believe that quality over quantity is the only way to go. I think Joseph Stalin said that quantity has a quality of its own. And if there's one guy you should trust. <laughs> you know, but he has a good point. <laughs> wow, I believe that is the first time that Joseph Stalin has been brought up on this podcast. Oh, That's a first. Won't be the last Congratulations, Harry. No, I'm not a big Stalin fan. <laughs> but, like, I would rather put out 10 
good cartoons a year than one really great 30 seconds you know like i would rather mm. have a, a so build up some more momentum so yeah i can't remember what the question was now but well the question was just about how do you stay sane when people are constantly asking yeah, you. it seems like people, are people cool. aren't constantly asking you nah people are really cool but how do you how do you stay motivated when you aren't being bugged maybe um because I guess uh, I, <laughs> no, I have an answer. I'm just wondering if I should give it. I guess the idea that I will leave this world, I will die mm. without passing on the ideas that I have in my brain, many of which are very stupid and immature. But the idea that I go and I haven't made contact with people and shown them my ideas for stories, and I have a lot in my head that I just can't get out of me because I foolishly chose animation as my medium. The, the thought of that uh, scares me. Um, I'm not really scared of, of being dead. I, I, I think that will be quite painless but the idea that i you know shuffle off this mortal coil and i haven't made more people laugh or entertained more people is uh terrifying so that's what keeps me motivated interesting and can i also just sidestep and say that um this is the second time that rob has heard the phrase shuffle off this mortal coil and the first the first time i told him i think yesterday and he goes what i said shakespeare so it's funny because you said that and it's almost like i see it in his face he goes i know what that means (laughs) you know it's funny that you mentioned that because i i yeah, I thought of doing a cartoon just in case I die. Because if I do like a, if I, <laughs> let's say I make a really silly cartoon about farts or whatever, and then I die, I don't want that to be my last. <laughs> I want to have like a secret death cartoon that I keep somewhere hidden. Uh, yeah. So then you might... don't want to have like a Raul Julia's last film is Street Fighter type yeah. of situation. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. come on. Street Fighter's great. <laughs> he killed it as M. Bison, though. <laughs> he uh, he was job. great. Yeah, he was uh, great. Raul Julia, but, like, but... is seriously, he's a fantastic actor. It's obviously, he was taken from us far too soon but i yeah. love Raul julia he, he's great as gomez as well in adam's family oh yeah definitely. i've thought about um, before i would never do this because i think it's very tacky but i thought about making a stan lee is dead cartoon because oh, you know that's coming oh, wow. sometime soon right like, we can be more than like a few years away and just i was thinking about how people would react you know he dies and the cartoon's up an hour later and people would think what the fuck happened <laughs> The only downside, I think, to that, other than the fact that it's horribly out of good taste, is that people would think, see, you can animate quickly, you lazy fuck. <laughs> I gotta be honest, I was gonna go to New York Comic Con when he was gonna be there, and uh, I couldn't make it. I was so upset because I've really wanted to meet him, and that, and I have to keep knocking on wood because I keep thinking that I gotta meet him now, or else it's gonna happen. Ray Harryhausen was the same feeling, mm. you know, and I, I don't want to miss my shot. Every time I'm talking about Stan Lee, you're right. I mean, every time he pops up, I just go, oh man, I gotta, I just gotta meet him. Was it you that mentioned you, you couldn't shake his hand or anything? Uh, it's the fear of germs and all that stuff at that age, I guess. But... <laughs> it would break off. Yeah. <laughs> Look, every time I've ever gone to a convention, I've gotten sick. That Comic Con bug, whatever. That's that's yeah. a real thing. I would tell everybody, don't touch, don't breathe on Stan Lee. Just... <laughs> Maybe Stan Lee's only like twenty five, and he's just yeah. done so many conventions. He just looks that way. It's a reverse Dorian Gray. He's got a really really nice picture on his wall. <laughs> it's just sapping the life out of him. I had a uh, the inverse of that. One of the cartoons that I thought was one of the funniest things I've ever written. I thought that at the time, it almost certainly was not. I wrote a Michael Jackson cartoon in early. 2009 before he died that I thought was very very funny it did not make fun of Michael Jackson I mean, that's the, I, mean uh-huh. I think he's a figure of fun like you could there's a lot you can make fun of I love right. his music but obviously he, he did a lot of or may have done a lot of questionable things and he certainly lived a bizarre lifestyle but the whole point of the cartoon was like making him seem like the most normal down to earth guy <laughs> ever there was always horribly always something went wrong to make the media think he, he, he lived the lifestyle he did but he's like a lumberjack in a cab and he's this really normal guy he's like really manly and I was gonna make it and then he died and I just kind of it's not that it would have been in bad taste because like I said it didn't really rip on him yeah. but it just didn't make sense to do it after he died right. like just it was too different so mm-hmm. kind of the idea got buried but um, you know that's why you gotta do stuff while you still can yeah because <laughs> yeah, other people will just die on you yeah, I know the fuckers <laughs> <laughs> how rude <laughs> alright so the next question is from Samuel R. Albro because he's all our bros he says Harry Styles is much more fluid and fully animated than is typical of animation created on the web. Uh, how does he balance his level of polish with the demands of an online audience? This has been addressed a few times, but I'm going to slightly alter it to something that I said that I was going to get to later, which I said earlier on. You had tweeted something, I believe, about animating on ones versus animating on twos. And I believe it was referring to a Starbarians video, and you were thinking about 
switching to animating on twos because no one seemed to notice the difference and you got that done much faster because mm-hmm. you animated half yeah well just kind of to address the first part of the question when the, the guy says um like how do i meet the demands of the audience mm. I, th- I think i don't <laughs> i put out one cartoon <laughs> in 2015 i don't think i meet the demands i think that for the most part people who keep tabs on what i do probably wonder where the fuck has this guy gone why doesn't he make more stuff uh, and right. i wonder that too so i think that there isn't much of a balance there i actually think mm. that for many years now i've put too much importance on not even the quality of the animation like i don't draw the most beautiful characters i don't do the greatest color palettes and the most beautiful backgrounds but just the amount of drawings i pack in to the animation the amount of in-betweens i think is too high mm. i want to at least for 2016 i have a couple of projects i need to finish that have already been started with quite a high number of in-betweens but my plan for 2016 is to scale back the in-betweens and i think if there's backlash from that i don't anticipate there to be much but if there is any i believe it will be outweighed by hopefully the amount of content increasing Uh, i certainly don't want to do less fewer drawings i want to do the same amount of drawings but i want them to go much further make more cartoons out of the same number of drawings than the same amount of hours spent at the desk if that makes sense yeah did I answer the Starbarians part yes. of the question? The amount of in-betweens that you do, anime on ones versus anime on twos is kind of what I related it to, but that addresses it. It's not necessarily a quality versus quantity issue as much as it is a, uh, I guess, a personal quality and uh, and a speed issue. Mm. The speed directly relates to the quantity you can put out, but it also affects your willingness to get involved in a project, I think. If you look at something and say, this is going to take me six months to do, then you might be a little less likely to jump in on it, knowing that there's this huge time commitment to it, yeah. as opposed to if it takes you three months, then you could say, okay, I could do that. Because if this one bombs, it's not as <laughs> it's not as bad as if I spend six months on it, because the you could put two out in the same amount of time. I think, it, at least for me, that's what I feel. If, if I can keep the time for me down, then it allows me to jump in on projects more readily. Yeah, I think I need to pick my fights as well. When I'm animating mm. a line of dialogue that is a joke, like the character needs to be really angry and that's part of the joke. They need to look really drunk and that's part of the joke. Put the effort in there to make sure that there's enough animation, there's, the drawings are good enough so that the joke is sold. You know, it doesn't have to mm. be dialogue. It could be a purely visual thing and that makes it even more important. But then when I have like a character in the background or a character that isn't really the focus of the shot turning to look at another character, why can't that just be like four drawings, you know? Right. It shouldn't have to be all treated exactly the same and I've done that for years and years and I really want to try and emphasize the right moments and de-emphasize the ones that I can get away with. Well actually Sam the guy who asked the question shared a video on my Rubber Onion Facebook page that was it was an animator for a game I hadn't heard of it before this but it was uh, Skull Girls I think Oh yeah. Uh, but she was talking about animation for games mm-hmm. and seeing the sprites that she was making and talking about efficiency and the way that she broke them down. Now of course these are fast moves. Looking at the way that it was broken down there's like no in-betweens there and there were six frames and it mm. looked great yeah it just happened very quickly i was trying to remember the name of the cartoon is it the it's not the dober brothers what am i trying to think of rob it was uh chuck jones animation early oh, on um there was a lot of animation a lot of smears season, right yeah Oh, one, yeah. one was like a green guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I've, I've seen guy. the one you mean. I can't remember the name either, but there's tons of smears. Very yes. few in-betweens, yeah. Oh, we're, let's, let's, we're just animation bus, so we can't remember the name of this classic <laughs> one, but I've seen the one you mean. It's tons of smears. I know the one you're going for. And it is. It's yeah. like the something brothers or the something boys, like the Dover yeah. boys or yeah, something. Yes, yes, yes. The Dover boys. That's what it is. D-O-V-E-R. Okay, so <laughs> moving on. This is, Let's just keep it going. Alex Harvey asks, what's your view on the 2D feature animation? climate. Do you think that it can make a successful comeback with, but with people like Brad Bird and uh, even like a CEO and director head of basically main guy at Leica, Travis Knight, mentioning their interest in doing 2D animated features and now the Dragon Slayer campaign being successful. Yeah, uh, I don't really see it making a big comeback. Like, I know there'll mm-hmm. be pockets of resistance and I know there'll be animated 2D theatrically released animated movies for years to come. Mm-hmm. Obviously a lot, lot less than there were 15, 20 years ago, but they'll still be made. I think that audiences today, and this is the thing, I, I have heard a lot of people say it's not the audience's 
that are making the decision. It's the studios. But I think the audiences do make a decision. I, I've heard yeah, that I some, agree. some kids today look at 2D cartoons as looking weird or old fashioned or flat or that's like, oh, that's dad's mm. thing. And I think it, to a lesser degree, has become the new black and white, uh, certainly for young yeah. audiences, uh, kids and families, people that aren't really animation buffs. I think they look at something like Frozen and they look at like, oh, you know, the characters look real. They look like dolls that have come to life. They're going to see that. And I don't really have many <laughs> <laughs> evidence, pieces of evidence I can use to back this up. But I think people see that as being higher in quality and more modern and more beautiful than 2D. Yeah. And I think 2D is, is as far as commercial mass audiences are concerned kind of an old hat now it's just all an old thing that is going to have a hard time uh, getting back into favor also uh this guy alex harvey says uh can you please send him a big hello from everyone and the animation ba course here at uca farnham for me <laughs> uh wow uh, i was like <laughs> Making fun of that course earlier on. <laughs> Who knows? It might have gotten <laughs> that's a big hello. Like, those, those hacks. No. Uh, yeah. Hi, guys. Um, I had a great time at that university, but like not for <laughs> academic reasons. I was, you know, it's just it's fun going there and uh, and being, you know, surrounded by art people. But uh, well, just, also you were there. <sighs> 2006 to 2009 or 2005 yeah so something, yeah, so something could have changed yeah. yeah it could be it could be way worse now yeah. uh, <laughs> i want to add though just i don't want to sound like i'm too down on 2d uh animation obviously i i love 2d animation um i think it's funnier than 3d like i laugh more at 2d yeah. i just think you can get more in a drawing than you can easily at least with a 3d rig uh in terms yeah. of sort of posing and character and stuff but I think even if 2D is fading on the theatrical scene, it's really alive online. You can make a 3D cartoon by yourself, but it's very difficult. You can make a 2D cartoon by yourself a lot easier. And I think that obviously for the independents, for people like me, that's the way to go. And I think that's how it's going to stay alive. And I think with, with comedy too, like who wants like 3D Rick and Morty? I don't think that's what I mean, the people want. I think for comedy and, and television and stuff, 2D will be alive for years to come. So I don't think 2D is going anywhere. But I think in terms of big family movies that are trying to make beautiful, marketable, pretty things, and not that there's anything wrong with that, but for the people who do want to do that, I don't think that 2D uh, is going to come back anytime soon. Alex Fox is uh, talking about when the next few episodes of Star Barons are finally completed and released. He's asking, will you release a Kickstarter or Patreon? You've already said that you're looking at Patreon. And by the way, I just started Patreon and I we can talk you know, off air about it a little bit about what I've kind of learned. But it's great. Community wise, hmm. it has been very interesting because the people that will put down money to support you are a very particular type of fan. Yeah. And that community becomes its own separate thing. You have in your fan base that you do, I think they would really support you. But he mentioned Kickstarter, which I didn't bring up before. And you said that you were thinking about possibly in the future doing a movie. Mm -hmm. If you do a Patreon and you're successful in being able to run the length of making these episodes on patreon mm -hmm. and then you go okay well if i can do this then i might be able to do a feature length film would you turn to kickstarter to try to you know? yeah i would consider it kickstarter that is in terms yes. of patreon is it alex he, he asked after yes. the next few episodes of starbarians are released it's gonna be alex way Foster. before then <laughs> all right <laughs> yeah well that's what i was saying about I, you know signing up now yeah to i would help love it if that. i could yeah. have the time and the resources to crank out a couple of episodes and then get around to patreon uh without kind of like talking about my own finances too much yeah I am possibly not going to be doing any big gigs this year for commissions for people, big paid for animations. Commissions, one-off commissions for individual people, I don't think I'm going to be doing illustrations. And that is because I want to concentrate on making my own content. I don't mm -hmm. think I'll be able to carve out a living from doing that on YouTube. So yes, Patreon is something that I'm looking at strongly. And I've made my mind up, even though I've kind of made fun of crowdfunding before. Uh, I, I think <laughs> most people will have picked up that I was making fun of greedy crowdfunders, not crowdfunding yes, in general. Yes, I, yes, think, yes. I think that um, honest crowdfunding is a very respectable thing to do. We'll probably have to address that in the kind of launch video because <laughs> I know that some people will be like, "You said this," but yeah, I'll have to say like, "No, that's not really what I what I said." But uh, yeah, Patreon is definitely something I I will look into doing this year, even though I don't think it will come after several episodes of Starbarians because that's like that's you know that could be eighteen months of work. What I hope for is that the reverse will happen and Patreon will enable me to forget about all other work and only make cartoons 
for YouTube and Newgrounds, and that's really all I want to do. So cartoons for people, entertain people, and hopefully also fund some live action projects on the site. That would be very, very good. What type of live action would you be thinking about uh, doing first? I have like a, a major life goal to make a horror comedy movie, which I've written. I think it could be fantastic. Even if it comes out just okay, I would be <laughs> I would be very happy with that. And that's something I'd love to do. I don't have the experience, certainly don't have the money because it would be probably hundreds of thousands of dollars. It would mm. be a lot of money to make. It's not Lord of the Rings, but it's not two guys in a room. There are monsters and special effects. Right. And I would really like to make that. That's that's my biggest goal. And I haven't told anyone about it. I don't talk about it on Twitter or online because there's nothing to talk about yet. It's simply an idea that I've written and I don't want to tell people something's going to come that may never come. But that's sort of what I'd like to work towards. So I, I want to do a couple of shorts. I want to get training. I want to uh, get experience and hopefully put a reel together to try and help finance a live action film, uh, which is not something I think I could do on Kickstarter. I think I've made my mark online as an animation guy and I don't think it would make sense to try and use my animation experience to kickstart a live action project so i think that's all on me so yeah that's that's my goal just to wrap it up this guy alex fox wrote a bunch of stuff and you know i'm sorry i'm kind of condensing these questions because you know they write a lot have a lot to say but i do want to say the last thing he said was thanks for answering if you do and keep on inspiring and creating you lovable piece of intergalactic 80s meat uh, <laughs> that's a very <laughs> apt description at least physically of what i resemble <laughs> big piece of meat yeah oh that's very nice alex thank you the the last question we have here is kind of a dig, which I thought was actually kind of fun. I, yes. I read these ahead of time. So not a dig at you. Oh, okay. And this is Sam Freeman says, what would you say to your old university tutors now that you have more recognition in the animation community than they do? Well, why would I talk to those losers? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, I'm kidding. They were all very nice to me. I think the thing that was cool is that they were nicer to me as a person than as a student. Like, I don't think mm -hmm. they liked my work. I remember like trying to explain, because I wanted to to try and make uh, Starbarians when I was in university. And we had to give this pitch to the whole class of what we wanted our final film to be. And I wanted mine to be Starbarians episode one. I wasn't going to call it episode one, but I was going to put it online as episode one and just really find a way to start my web series while uh, claiming to be in education. But uh, I remember the plot for the original episode was the Starbarians face a monster that eats boobs. <laughs> and it would be fair of me to describe the atmosphere in the college as, or university, um, if you're English, as liberal and had a lot of female tutors, very nice women, but I don't think they were in the mood for gory, boob-filled, <laughs> violent animation. <laughs> but I remember these people telling me, the stuff you're doing, this is nice, Harry, but it isn't you. I don't think this is really you. And I always thought that was hypocritical because I actually felt it was me. I grew up hmm. watching Saturday morning cartoons. I, I collect toys. I watch action movies and horror movies. I'm a big kid at heart. I'm physically a large child, is what I'm saying. And that is me. That is what I like. And I felt like, no, you guys have to understand this is really what, what I'm like this is what I want to make so I you know it was kind of tense with them but they were cool people they were they were nice to me at the very last sort of day that I was at the university uh, we all went out for like for a drink and one of them got very very drunk and it was, that was kind of fun sort of broke down some <laughs> barriers to see your teachers get drunk by the way I never graduated either so I, mm. I actually dropped out in like the last month of a three-year course really which is, <laughs> not as a whole other story I was uh, <laughs> at least a hard-working animator but I was not a good student in terms of sort of meeting deadlines and doing boring work like writing essays. Meet and deadlines. It started all the way back then. <laughs> oh, it started long before then. But no, I wouldn't have anything negative to say to them. I would say that I hope they're doing well and I hope I meet them again soon. And I also have a problem with the idea that they don't they have any more traction in the animation world than I do. They're obviously operating in different circles, but uh, I think right. they do good stuff. It's interesting that this ended up being the last question, which I just thought was kind of a joke thing, but you brought up something which I think is actually pretty profound for people who might be listening to this either either as students or not as students, that you actually saw through the course of, well, your course, that in order to express yourself honest and true to who you are, you had to go independent. You went on your own path and then started doing things yourself and got popularity off of that because it was honest. That's a very difficult thing to do because that's why we do this. That's why you do any sort of content creation is expressing yourself in some way. And you found a way to make that work on your own terms. Even if you're not meeting deadlines, 
They're your deadlines. That's a kind of a great message. Saturday Morning Watchmen was like the watershed moment for me because that was the first cartoon that got a lot of play online and a lot of people kind of contacted me by that. I began to talk to the BBC over here in the UK wow. uh, about doing some animation, some web stuff for them. And it just hit me that I was being killed by this huge essay. That was the thing. I had to do a 10,000 word essay and I didn't know what it was I was supposed to write. I think Frank Zappa said that writing about music is like tap dancing about architecture. And I <laughs> <laughs> I kind of felt that way about animation. Like, I didn't really want to write about animation. I wanted to make animation. And I thought, I'm spending all this time writing. Why don't I just go and make YouTube videos and make money? That's the end game. That's the only reason I'm here is to make animation. I didn't really go to university to get a degree anyway. I, I did it to shut my parents up or at least one side of the family up. And I just wanted a couple of extra years to figure things out. And that's basically what I used it for. But yeah, it's. I think there's a danger of saying corny things that people have heard time and time again, because I think the more you hear something, the less effect it has. But I think it's right. I think that your own voice, your you you-ness, you know, the thing that makes you you, is really valuable. Of course, some people do suck. It's just a, a truth that there, there are some people out there that are really boring and lame, and the thing that is the most them that they could ever make might be a horrible, boring thing. But I think the optimist in me says that most people have have something about them that's interesting or fascinating and unique. And I think if you do want to sort of succeed, and this goes back to an earlier question that somebody asked about how do you make your own ideas catch on online, mm -hmm. I think that by being really unique, and I don't even think that I am hugely unique, but I think that I have something certainly that's helped me out. I think that your uniqueness might not appeal to everyone, but it will make a core audience, if they're able to find your work, really be drawn to you and that will be really valuable. That's excellent. I agree with everything you just said. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> I have nothing more to add. I think that's a perfect place to end it. I'll hand it over to you to tell people where they can follow you and if you want to tease anything upcoming. I think you've pretty much done it in the uh, in the show. Basically, if you create something, where you will upload it once it's done. That oh, gosh. Well, I don't have a website. Google my name, Harry Partridge, if you want to watch any of my cartoons. They're on YouTube and Newgrounds. And I have a Twitter account, which you'll be able to find by Googling my name. Uh, that's it. That's there's no more work you need to do. <laughs> that would be all you need to do. Do you have any thought about when you're going to possibly uh, launch a Patreon? Oh, gosh. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> when do we think this episode's coming out? This episode will come out the very end of February, uh, February 24th. Oh, well, let's do that thing they do in uh, in the real world. I think it'll be the first quarter of 2016. This was awesome. Thanks for taking the time to answer our questions and the fan questions and everything. And we love your work and can't wait to see what else you do. No, it, honestly, it was a pleasure. It's really nice. Thank you. And that'll do it for this episode of the Rubber and Animation Podcast. Wait, 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 wait. Don't go anywhere yet. I have to tell you that you can give me money on patreon.com slash rubber onion that'll help me keep making cool stuff like this and other things like animated shorts, tutorials. But you know, you can support without giving me money. Just hop over to iTunes and give this little podcast a review because it really super de duper helps out. I want to extend a huge thanks to Harry Partridge for being an awesome interview and taking the time to talk with us in the first place. You should check out his YouTube channel if you haven't already. He's simply Harry Partridge on there and follow him on Twitter at Happy Harry Tunes. When he gets his Patreon, Patreon up and running, you'll be able to follow that link from this podcast post on my website, but I believe it'll probably be under his given name there anyway. So as he said, Google. I'll also throw a thanks in the direction of my co-host, Mr. Rob Yulfo, for being a nervous trooper this whole time. You can and should follow him at Rob Yulfo on Twitter and his brand new and not updated at all website, MrRobYulfo.com. That's M-R-R-O-B-Y-U-L-F-O.com. And I'm Steven Brooks. I am the Rubber Onion, and you can follow me at Rubber Onion everywhere. The main places I want to direct your attention this week are Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and of course, Newgrounds. So we upload the podcast there as well. We all have a lot of love for Newgrounds. Please do check out my new video blog episode on backgrounds. That's number nine. And it's up on rubberin.com slash blog right now. The ebook on how to start your freelance animation business is almost ready and will be up at the end of the month. As for my physical in the real world published through Focal Press Animation Textbook, you can pre-order it on Amazon. The link will be in the podcast post. It's currently listed as Traditional Flash 12 Principles of Animation in Adobe Flash, but it will ship under its new name, Traditional Animate 12 Principles of Animation in Adobe Animate CC. Thanks, Adobe. I'm kidding. 
Moving on. That's all the plugs. Thanks again for listening. Looking forward to seeing your cartoons for the animation battle this month at hashtag rubber onion battle on Instagram. Okay, I guess that was one more plug, but look how organic. The topic is superhero with useless power, by the way. Okay, now that's all the plugs. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like it, subscribe, tell your friends about it, and don't forget to say hi. Bye. Bye.